turn to the witness of Scripture together in these moments that we have, uh, blessed time together. Luke chapter 6, verses 17 through 26. Hear these words of Scripture. Jesus came down with them and stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea, Jerusalem and the coast of Tyre and Sidon. They had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases, and those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. And all in the crowd were trying to touch him, for power came out from him and healed all of them. Then he looked up at his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you, revile you, and defame you on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for surely your reward is great in heaven. For that is what their ancestors did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who are laughing now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all speak well of you, for that is what their ancestors did to the false prophets. The word of God for all of us as we are in worship together in these moments. Thanks be to God. Amen. So a lot of Bible scholars call this section in Luke's Gospel the Sermon on the Plain. Sort of an interesting phenomenon between the way Matthew tells the story of Jesus and the way Luke tells it. In Matthew we get the Beatitudes, uh, the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5. Jesus is on a mountaintop. In part, perhaps, it's because I'm sure Jesus spoke in all kinds of places and preached on mountaintops and preached in valleys. And, and I'm sure the basic content of the Beatitudes, while it sounds very different here in Luke, was a theme that Jesus preached on far more occasions than just once. Matthew loves to depict Jesus on the mountaintops because Matthew has got this whole agenda dividing the teaching sections into five different parts. I don't know if you knew that or not, friends. Uh, five sections of teaching all gathered together in Matthew's Gospel, followed up by five sections of miracles and healing and events. It's sort of structured to mimic the Torah, the first five books in the Old Testament, the books of Moses. And because Moses delivered the law from a mountaintop, Matthew loves to share the stories in which Jesus is on a mountain and probably ignore some of the other times that Jesus taught. Uh, Matthew also gathers that teaching together into five books to mimic the Torah. In Luke, Luke has a little different agenda, and so it makes sense to me that Luke would pick the time when Jesus shared those similar themes, uh, two qualities to it. One, it's on the plain, not Jesus lifted up, but Jesus down amongst the people. And the second one is that the spiritual side of the teaching in Matthew, the Beatitudes are very spiritualized sorts of teaching, the poor in spirit, those sorts of things. In Luke, it's much more visceral, immediate, and in this world, in our behaviors in life, in our bodies, in the flesh, in our relationships with other people. In Luke, it's simply, blessed are the poor. And that's very striking and very telling and suggests a whole lot of things to us. No one telling is right. They just pick up different themes and different occasions on which Jesus shares. And with all the wonderful things that Jesus says to us, and as important as they are, what I want to invite you to look at me and focus on in these moments, friends, is the setup to that remarkable teaching. I, I want to focus not on what Jesus says, even though almost every time I preach this kind of passage, that's what I focus on. But I want to draw your eye to verse 19 and this little note that sets up for the teaching. It's the link between what Jesus has done up until this point in Luke's gospel and then Luke's version of the teaching we would know as the Beatitudes. Uh, but this verse, this verse I want to beckon you towards. 
because maybe this verse is essential to be primed and ready to hear the fullness of the teaching of Jesus, the spiritual side and the visceral earthly side. Jesus high and lifted on a mountain, Jesus down on the plain, level plain ground, eye to eye with us. It's this interesting note. And all in the crowd were trying to touch him, for power came out from him and healed all of them. And all in the crowd were trying to touch him, for power came out from him and healed all of them. And I think, uh, briefly, friends, this one verse that links the past and the present moment, that sets us up to listen to the teachings of Jesus in one of those passages that, that so eloquently captures his overall message. I, I think what we're invited to think about in that one little verse, verse 19, is, first of all, th those words, they were trying to touch him. And for me, it's, it's an odd turn of phrase in the Gospels. For so often, the emphasis in Scripture is on the action and the initiative of God. It is God and Jesus who comes after us. It is Jesus who reaches out to touch the untouchable like lepers. It is Jesus who initiates the teaching. And yet, at the same time, I think there's something really significant and very real about the spiritual journey in that short verse and that turn of phrase that Luke uses. They were trying to touch Jesus. And how much of the spiritual life is really a set of opportunities in which we attempt on our part to reach out and make contact with the living God in our midst? And are we eager to do that? And are we actually using all the opportunities before us to reach out and make that contact, to reach out and try to touch God? It's the, it's the on the crowd, we're trying to touch him. We do so many things in the spiritual journey. And quite often, we, we gauge and we assign value to the things we do based on the outcomes. We judge and we ascertain whether or not something we do has been successful based on the results. We are extremely results-oriented people. And we ask one another to show results. But you know, friends, we're, we're living here in a time in which results are a pretty difficult thing to come up with in all kinds of ways in life. The business sector is trying to come up with some sort of results in the middle of a pandemic that has gone on for far too long. And, and even with signs of an upswing, still, we're all trying to catch up with what has been and what has been happening. We expect a lot of ourselves, perhaps too much of ourselves, and often too much of others. that word trying to touch him that catches me. And I'm a Star Wars fan. I think of Master Yoda telling Luke, there is no try. There's only do. And I wonder how much of Yoda's words, which are wise but not the same as the words of God, how much of those kind of things in the culture around us, whether it's business or Star Wars, creep into our spiritual lives and affect us and impact us and chart the course for how we see the world and ourselves more than we would ever realize. Perhaps... This one little verse on the road to a more famous teaching section, if we slow down and linger over it for just a moment and pay that close attention, as I often try to do with you friends, pay attention to the little words and the significance of what's included because all of it is on purpose. Luke didn't accidentally relate the attempt to touch Jesus. It's there for a reason. What if in the spiritual life, our trying to reach out and touch God 
is where the true value exists. Not basing spiritual significance on making that contact and having that, that deep spiritual experience or encounter. It, it's, the, it's the mountaintop experiences and the craving for that mountaintop. Uh, another example of why I, I marvel at Luke's insistence in these small moments of, of indicating things like Jesus was down on the plane with everybody on this day. What if the spiritual life is not about those mountaintop experiences, about, but about the day-in, day-out attempt to reach out and make contact with God? It, it's based on, on the belief that God is there and God is present that God is reachable and not at a distance, that we're, we're trying to make that connection and God is there and available, but there also requires a little bit of effort on our part. But, but the very attempt, the trying, Luke says, seems to elicit this power that goes forth from God. That power goes forth from Jesus. It's odd. It almost seems unbidden. It's almost as if it's, it's not in Jesus' control to lavish this healing and this grace upon the crowds who press around him. There are other times in the gospel where it seems to indicate such is the case. It is the disposition of Jesus not to hold back from people or keep things back or to reserve power for those moments when maybe somebody gets the magic prayer right or maybe somebody is deserving. But it almost seems as if, here and in other places in the gospel, that Jesus can't help but have this power from God flow forth. It oozes from him into the world around. And our sometimes feeble, flailing attempts to make contact, convinced that when we reach out, God is there. Perhaps an openness to reach out and touch and find God in surprising places. When we reach out to touch a neighbor, when we reach out with grace and compassion. Do we believe? That is an attempt to touch that life, and in so doing, we touch the face of God, or do we not see it as that important and significant? And I believe that's what this verse is getting at for us in our lives. Our feeble attempt is enough. The trying is the true value of the spiritual life. And the trying is rewarded with a power that is unstoppable. It's not the whim of God to bestow it here and there, but it's always there. And the more we try, the more we reach out, the more we attempt, the more we seek, the more we recognize God present with us and all around us, the more we extend ourselves, regardless of the results or the outcomes, or any tangible sort of proofs or, or, or expectations we have that may be met or maybe won't be met, that there is healing in the very act of trying to touch the presence of God with us and around us, in us and in the people nearby. What if this is to be the true nature of the spiritual life. And how much does that, and would that, change for us? In the way we go about our lives and in the way we recognize the spiritual journeys of others. The person who is far from perfect but is trying is more a saint than the ones who seem to have their act together and don't think they need the healing or wholeness from God. So complacent, they don't try new things anymore to connect. This small little verse on the road to a great and famous teaching passage from Jesus contains an important invitation for us to look at our spiritual lives and the everyday world around us in a whole different way. 
and how much grace and how much healing is there for those of us who rejoice in trying. trying. Trying in trying times by God's grace. Thanks be to God for the famous teachings of Jesus and the little verses along the way that fill in a much needed gap for us in our lives. Let us pray. And so, Heavenly Father, we thank you for the life of Jesus, his teaching, his example. We thank you for the lessons we learn in his word, and we thank you for the lessons that we learn sprinkled in and around his life. We learn from him, and we learn from the crowd around him. We learn from what he did, and we learn from the attempts of people nearby to understand, to connect, to reach out. We learn from those who give up trying. We learn from those relentless in the attempt. We learn from those who succeed. We learn from those who question what success really is. We learn and we grow by your grace and by your power. We shift in our view of ourselves and of you, O oh God, towards grace and wholeness, love and wonder. And so be with us in this time of worship and in our lives as we try to live your way. Be with those we pray for, be with those who mourn, be with those who need you. Oh God, be with us. And you are, we, we know, so remind us that you're there, that we might be bold enough to reach out and try once again to connect to you, our God. And so we thank you for this invitation to ponder and to live according to your word. I pray in Jesus' name.